We're going to uh, start today just with a little video that we took in my hometown. I, outside of the food stuff, I do a lot in, with kids and kids running and hosting running events for kids. Um, so I'm going to start with this video because this is just an image of what we want the future to be like for our kids. So this is a video of healthy kids. Winners, set. This is my town, Shepherdstown, West Virginia. It's a town of 3,000 on the eastern panhandle of West Virginia. And these are kids doing a one mile kids fun run. Yeah, my kids, uh, they all run, their friends are running. So you'll see about 200 kids today in the 5K. And that'll make my day. Yeah, these kids are in the 5K. And we do uh, kids obstacle course races too. Uh, ben would like that. Where's, where's Ben, Dr. Ben? We uh, warm them up with burpees and push ups and things. I can choose which place to go If only in my mind So I'm gonna run, 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 run Catch the They do get pizza at the end of this run, 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 run. What do you notice about their faces? The best part They're smiling, right? They're happy <laughs> the most fun was when I sprinted at the end on the football field. I can't wait to finish to meet my friends. The best part was going downhill, except when you had to go back up. The hills were very, very long, but I did walk. The hardest part, probably when you turned around, that first hill when you turned around. I did pretty good. I passed my mom. All my family's here. They're running. But sadly, those kids, that's, this is the first generation of kids that will die uh, earlier than their parents and sicker than their parents, so unless we do something about it. Um, so this is a childhood obesity pandemic, you know, policies driving it and the science and practice to flatten the curve. Probably put a question mark, because I, I don't know how we're going to flatten the curve. That's why we're here. Um, objectives. You know, this, what do we know about pediatric obesity? You know, what do we think? What do we have no clue? And what are some ways we can maybe try to go forward? Disclosures, I still have a lot to learn about pediatric <laughs> obesity. The rest of it's just the usual nonsense. Um, I actually own a little running store selling these minimal and barefoot shoes. Did you notice how, how springy those kids were and how they moved? Yeah, so if you don't put shoes on kids, they, that's their fascia. That's, like, that's a, a wonderful thing to, to maintain um, for your whole life. Uh, uh, so this article was written in one of our uh, media magazines through the state of West Virginia. It's like, you know, the thing that said all the restaurants and all, but it, it talked about, you know, man on a mission. And it's my goal, you know, similar to Steve Finney with Verda, is to reverse diabetes and, you know, pick a number in West Virginia and reverse obesity. So, you know, my colleague Chrissy Van Hills and I are in, in a clinic now de-prescribing medications, you know, and trying to do it on a shoestring, you know, with our cell phones and ways we can connect with patients, you know, within EMR systems, outside of EMR systems, but it's difficult. It's not uh, embraced globally to do this. Um, I think this is probably the most important question. You know, when, when we come and talk about, you know, a disease entity, usually we know what causes it, and we're trying to, but we don't know what causes childhood obesity. If anyone has some ideas, <laughs> share that. You know, 1974, you know, like this is not new, right? Obesity is the most, this is the Lancet, most important nutritional disease, the factor most closely associated with atherosclerotic disease. Probably the obese adult can never be cured. Most obesity could with care be prevented. And we're gonna get into that, but I think before we actually talk about pediatric obesity, I think we have to frame just how we think. And this probably applies to a lot of what we do. So this is a, an interesting book, just about how humans think. And there's something called intellectual humility. So, you know, we all need to be really humble in, in, in this space because, you know, the problem's only getting worse. You know, listen to ideas that make you think hard, not just opinions that make you feel good. You know, the purpose of learning isn't to affirm our beliefs, it's to evolve our beliefs. 
you know, we don't have to believe everything we think. If knowledge is power, knowing what we don't know is wisdom. We see this a lot in the obesity space, the diabetes space, young learners. You know, it's called the Dunning-Kruger effect. You know, people get a little bit of knowledge and they have a lot of confidence to give advice. I mean, how many of y'all have seen that? Yeah, you see a med student, they'll go to something sponsored by PCRM or the ACLM, you know, AC, the Lifestyle Medicine Group, you know, all about, you know, vegetarianism, the way to reverse diabetes, and it'll be highly funded. You know, yeah, these are, you know, these kind of thought leader folks. And then they'll go give advice to patients. Um, it's, it could be dangerous. Uh, you know, I'm probably somewhere in the bottom part of this curve with uh, pediatric obesity just by observing it. You know, it's starting to make a little more sense now. Um, you know, so I think we have to have some confident humility about this. You know, have a, that's a source of strength, you know, a source of pride. That, like, we don't know a lot about this. But we do see a lot of cognitive entrenchment, you know, in the space of pediatric obesity, adult obesity, and, and diabetes. So I'm encouraging all of us not to have our own cognitive entrenchment that, you know, low carb is, you know, the answer for world peace. You know, it's, it's a very powerful tool in the toolkit, you know, for most of the people we see. But there's a lot of other ideas out there that are, that are evolving, and we've heard a lot of them during this, this, uh, this weekend, especially the issues with food addiction, you know, how powerful that is. We didn't even get into the microbiome. But there's, you know, think, thinking like a scientist is, is going to help us solve this. Um, there's actually, there's a little uh, test you can take in, the, in this uh, website from the book, and I think we've all witnessed this and probably been guilty of it ourselves. You know, we've been preachers maybe a little bit about this, or you've witnessed someone else prosecuting, you know, we're trying to win an argument in a debate, um, politician mode of thinking. You see this a lot with medical students, and I probably was there at one time, you know, if this attending likes, you know, this medication or this style, you know, they're going to kind of play on that side. Oh, I'm with Dr. Westman this week, you know, the, let's get rid of the carbs and that. But yeah, so they're all, and that's how medical students get evaluated. You know, it's very subjective and by someone who's you know, rotating with them, and you know, we kind of like people who agree with our opinions. If I'm a student and I don't agree with the attending with the long coat, it's probably not going to fare well on my evaluation. And then the scientist mode, searching for the truth, but I'm just going to fly through these, but uh, this is kind of academics. This is what we need and this is what we don't need, because if we're going to figure this out, you know, we need disagreement. You know, if we all a consensus opinion, if we all follow that, if the consensus agrees that consensus is right, nothing will ever change. You know, we need an RBG out there, you know, to be in dissenting opinions, which creates what's called a task conflict. So I think it's wonderful to be in a room where people have disagree, and even here, you know, in this back and forth, you know, this is great to have some slightly disagreeing opinions because then we can kind of search for the truth. But what, this, what evolves a lot of times in the medical system is you get a relationship conflict and a power mismatch where if you disagree in the wrong way to the wrong person, then you can get marginalized. And that's not a healthy way to solve problems. So let's try to keep things at task conflict when we're working with people and not let it get personal. Um, because what we don't need also is, you know, and, and Tim Noakes has written about this, is academic bullying, you know, where you are removed from things in your healthcare system based on your opinions, and you don't have control o over that. You know, papers don't get published. Challenge network. So what that is, this is a challenge network, and I'm on some email list groups, you know, so if we have something that we've come across that we're trying to learn, you know, you throw it out to your network of colleagues, and, and you learn from that. So we, we should all develop, and maybe even in this room, you've met some people, exchange emails, you know, talk about things, you know, and this is great to have all these different fields uh, allied together. You know, I asked this question to Gary, you know, because, you know, if you're a doctor and you say children are just, uh, are, you know, little adults, you know, the, the pediatricians will throw you on the coals. But, you know, maybe with metabolism, there are some similarities. So we're going to dig into that a little bit today. You know, a little bit about the, the politics of this. And, you know, people are fed by the food industry, which pays no attention to health, and treated by the health industry, which pays no attention to food. Um, that's, a, that's a big one, right? Uh, you know, how did I get into this pediatric obesity space? And I'm a family doc, so I treat all spectrum. But there was a conference, uh, it was the Southern Obesity Summit. It was held in West Virginia. I was the medical director of this conference. It was in 2017. 
you know, and, and uh, you know, the day I showed up, I was kind of uh, not very optimistic that this was the group that was gonna, <laughs> that was gonna solve um, obesity. You know, I didn't see a single person take the stairs the, the whole weekend. But that pediatric obesity was a big focus on, and we had breakout groups among the state. And our state was about ready to push out what was called 5210, which was an AAP program. You know, well, we just need to just tell all the kids to do this. This is gonna be our statewide program to you know, prevent and reverse obesity. And I called it out. I said, look, I don't think this is going to work, right? Let's just tell kids to have five servings of fruits and vegetables, you know, two hours of less of screen time, get an hour of physical activity, no sugary drinks, but yet, you know, milk and, and the skimmy milk was what didn't count in there. Um, then they're going to go home to, you know, pizza and Mountain Dew, but it's fine. As long as they get their five fruits and veg, it's going to work. I mean, how many of you all think that would work for obesity? Just telling kids, knowing in school, ketchup is a vegetable, fruit cups with heavy syrup is a, is a fruit. How many of you all think there's even a screaming chance that that would work? Like thinking like a scientist. No, it's not going to work. Yeah, so, you know, I and, and, you know, Chrissy was part of this, you know, like before this conference, you know, chains of emails with literature, let's not just launch this thing. And then I walk into the room at the end and it was pretty much the train had left the station. This was going to be our state obesity plan. Do you think obesity has gone down in West Virginia among children? Negative. All right. So, you know, in this document, it's a 270 page document about uh, 5210. There was one paragraph on the science. Scientific rationale, emerging science suggests fruits and vegetable consumption may help prevent weight gain when total calories are controlled, may be an important aid. That was it. That was the science of it too. All it was about how to implement it in your school, but that was the science. And I was okay, we're not thinking like scientists. And I actually texted Rob Lustig, you know, just, okay, am I crazy or am I, you know, I trust Rob, he's a pretty smart guy, way smarter than I am. Um, Rob, I'm trying to convince my colleagues, the AP. 5210 will not reverse obesity. More complex than that. Rob, you're right. <laughs> it won't. <laughs> Keep working. <laughs> so, yeah, I like it. Yeah, I mean, it says it all, right? And uh, I like Rob. Um, and actually, yeah, it was studied. Maine was the, the state that they were highlighting. Office-based intervention was associated with no important, no significant improvement. BMI Z scores, okay. You know, I mean, I think, you know, maybe I've been a little bit of this chicken, little the sky is falling, the sky is falling, you know, the end is near, you know, this like, yeah, like shout it out, right? This is a disaster. I testified last summer to the DGA uh, scientific advisory when they were coming out with the 2020, preliminary for the 2020 US dietary guidelines, which obviously are a big hot mess. But, you know, so this excludes about, you know, it's only for the healthy people. And in my state, that's the minority. So, you know, made the case, uh, most people, there were 80 people had their three minutes of shame to present to this group, and most of them were lobbyists. Uh, Dr. Sethi was wonderful from Stanford. She uh, does a lot of work with, with uh, binge eating, um, metabolic psychology, so she, she was really good um, presenting too. You know, I wrote a blog about this, you know, warning, you know, for healthy Americans only. But, you know, uh, I, th I think it's slow change. You know, from top down stuff is slow. That's why the bottom up stuff, you know, the Nutrition Coalition, I was one of the founding members with Nina Teicholz, the Nutrition Coalition. We actually got um, the National Academy of Science, Engineering, and Medicine looked at, independently reviewed the DGA process and the guidelines. And, and the uh, report was it's not evidence based. But even this did not reverse that 2020. Um, dietary guidelines, you know, and then you still have stuff like this, you know, shocking, you know, eating too many eggs can still be risky, you know, but most people don't have to give them up entirely. But that, that dogma and that cognitive entrenchment is still there. Um, another opportunity I had just to listen to thought leaders in obesity, you know, so if we're going to solve pediatric obesity, I kind of think of it like this, you know, so the Manhattan Project, right? So we had to figure that one out, right, to end World War II. You know, so you pretty much lock all the brightest people in the room, you know, Alamosa, until you figure this out, right? That's probably the coronavirus vaccine thinking, right? They just locked every scientist in a room and they, and they you know, make vaccines in, in two months, right? Like, we're not leaving the room until we figure this out. So I'm not sure how, how they invited uh, me into this, but I was the AAFP's representative into this uh, think tank sponsored by RAND. CDC was there, AAP, nursing, you know, a lot of public health leads from around the country. And, um, you know, it, there was uh, Bill, William Dietz was, was there. He's like one of the big leads in pediatrics. But there was a lady who was the uh, lead on 
on a, in, in a pediatric bariatric surgery center from the Midwest. And she said this, we put the kids on this very extreme diet for four weeks and they lose most of their liver fat, lose about 10% of their body weight and the surgery is safer. And, uh, and I, you know, I kind of asked her, I didn't ask many questions, there's like a bug on the wall in this thing, so I kind of raised my hand in the back and said, ma'am, you know, can you, can you tell me what's this extreme diet? What, what, what are they eating? Oh, they're eating meat and eggs and vegetables and fish. <laughs> and I kind of said, well, isn't that what we want kids to eat? <laughs> and there was kind of silence, and then they moved on to the next topic. But I left that room, I was like... If this, is, if this is the Manhattan Project, it's, you know, surrender now, <laughs> right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I actually looked up, this was, you know, this uh, study that was referenced there, four-week uh, perioptive ketogenic micronutrient, blah, blah, blah. But we also found, surprisingly, buried in the conclusion discussion section, they liked the diet, the low rates of hunger. So what would plan A be? Keep them on the diet, right? Yeah, keep them on the diet. Yeah, so current recommendations. I know this is small. You'll have these slides. These are the current recommendations, right? AAP, what else? I mean, the small print there, CDC, National Heart and Lung Blood Institute, and NIDDK, all these big groups. Low fat, low fat, whole grains. This is still in there, right? These are the, you go to CDC's website on diabetes, it's like low fat. And this is, well, obviously there's been some failures with the CDC this year. So I think like, yeah, so maybe the good news of that is they're gonna read that and all oh, the CDC says low fat, so maybe they're wrong. Um, AAFP, right? So yeah, like, look, what you should know, type two diabetes in, in youth, fruits, vegetables, whole grains, you know, lean meats, stuff, low fat milk. Ask your doctor who's being trained by this. All right, this, this stuff's on the website now, right? Type 2 diabetes in children. Not, carbohydrate is not even mentioned in the entire article. You know, so kind of here's kind of where we are in pediatric obesity. So we know that, yes, if you take people's stomach and intestines out and put them in a bucket, they will lose weight. Yes, you will. Bob Sivis had to leave last night, you know, and he's, he's wonderful because he uses that as a tool, right? So, but, but you know, speak to him and like, I think the approach he, he gives is try not to do that. We know that you know, lifestyle modification, the risk is low, but the effectiveness is almost nothing, right? Pharmacotherapy, nothing. So there's this void. How can we have large impact at low risk? That's why we're here. You know, so what do we know about pediatric obesity? You know, so this is just how to define it. These are CDC graphs, weight charts. So if it's 95th percentile or above on this BMI, chart uh, per, per age, you know, then you're considered obese. Overweight is 85 to 95th percentile. Um, but we've kind of have these new charts. So these are the expanded charts. So that 95th percent is called class one and 120% of 95th percent is class two, 140% of, of 95th percentile is class three. So these are the ones, you know, we use quite a bit in, in West Virginia, unfortunately. You know, in the doctor's offices, you know, quite a bit of the same dogmas out there, you know, calories in, calories out, you know, 3,500 calories in a pound, you know, if you eat 500 less, you know, it's, it's the same types of conversations are still happening happening in doctor's offices. You know, I think this is probably true, you know, so there's a lot we don't know, but this, this I think, uh, I've just observed. If you are hungry, there's only one solution for hunger. What is that? <laughs> to eat. So anything you do that makes someone hungry, what are they gonna do? Eat, is it gonna work? No, if you're a child and you're hungry, what are you gonna do? Eat, okay, so let's, let's non-negotiable. You know, so default today is to eat. When I was a kid, right, like, we didn't have snacks. And I'm not even that old, right, maybe, but I'm 54. But yeah, I mean, the default now is to eat. Six meals a day, snack here. This is real. This is a car that has 19 cup holders. <laughs> so, what is it? It's a cafeteria. It's, I'm not making this shit up. What, I mean, what do you do with, you got one for your M&Ms and one for your juice? And, I mean, what do you have three cup holders per door? Insane, yeah, here's, I'm just, I'm flying through a lot of these charts because you just see the picture, you know, adult childhood obesity, and then look at the trajectory, it's going up like a skateboard ramp. 
This is a pandemic, you know, so a pandemic is defined by a disease that is spread across countries, affects a large number of people. Obesity and diabetes has reached pandemic levels. The WHO, absolutely no countries are on track to reach their targets, you know, for obesity, you know, for decline and maintenance, right? So 0% right now, you know, type 2 diabetes is a global pandemic. This was written about 2017. These are the numbers for kids around the globe, the trajectory to 2025. You know, we're that one right there in the Americas, 18.1%. You know, this is from the same report, and you see that 0.0% uh, chance that we're going to meet the goals of the WHO and the World Obesity Forum, 0.0% chance. So, so no, things aren't looking good. Um, this, this slide, I think, is somewhat telling. I think we, a lot of us have uh, read this report. This was the CDC's report on obesity. It's greater than 40% now in our country. But what's kind of terrifying about this is that they're reaching adulthood. So the 20-year-olds have 40% obesity. So where are we failing? We're failing our kids, right? Because what are the odds? I, I think, yeah, yesterday we saw, yeah, if you're an obese adult, what are the odds of becoming a normal weight adult? It's not zero, but it's, it's actually the more like morbidly obese, I have a slide, it's like one in a thousand, one in a thousand. So it's, it's, yeah, it's hard. We can't treat it, right? This is just around the globe. You see every single continent, every single continent. Um, this just published yesterday, COVID, COVID mitigation strategies. Has this been kind to children? Negative. Right, increasing obesity, decreasing cardi cardiovascular fitness. Look at the runtime. And this is Austria. You know, I think of Austria as a pretty active place. You know, so this is you know they kick our butt in the presidential fitness challenge for kids. You know, Austria, all the European countries. But look at that. That's kind of sad. Look at the and this is kind of interesting too. So the kids who had a sports club actually did a little better. At least they stayed engaged. You know, it's probably something social about that. But the ones who just sat in front of the the screen. You know, and remember the AAP saying less than two hours of screen time, then COVID hit. Well, let's just ignore that advice. Let's just park every child <laughs> for the whole school day in front of a screen. Just, you know, forget that advice. But yeah, the BMI's going up. Obesity's going up. This is like a year, right? That's a big trajectory in like a year. And this is Austria, right? Where they, you know, hills are alive with the sound of music and stuff. And <laughs> but no, they're like hiking. Okay, this is in the same uh, JAMA this week too. This is uh, Kaiser Permanente, Southern California, Wake in and Adelaide. Lessons, um, and, and the trajectory was was pretty remarkable, you know. And that's a U.S. Uh, pretty similar, maybe to populations we see. Childhood obesity uh, epidemic. This is a really good Nature article. Four uh, childhood obesity has rid, risen four times in the last uh, four decades. So, the, and you see these curves here in the next slide. So the top one is the obesity, and these are just different nations of in the world. So, so you're looking at developing and developed nations. It's all going up. And then there's uh, underweight children. Most of those are developing uh, parts of the world. The big orange there is a lot of this Asia. Um, but yeah, so, so the underweight's going down a little bit, but obese, that's a shocking rise in obesity all over the world. There's my little state there, West Virginia, you know, number one. And, you know, we're hoping to have a good football season, number one, but this is not a, a good one here. Yeah, this is, uh, you know, looked at this video a bit ago. This is a... Uh, Charleston, West Virginia, 1981-82, and you, it's just a, like a nine-minute video, and it's like, where are the obese people? <laughs> you, you don't see them. It was uh, you know, four decades ago. Here's different ethnic groups. You see Native Americans, um, gay, lesbian, bisexual. I think there's, you know, maybe there's some trauma there. Um, and these kids, you know, they're not being embraced by their communities, and, and that might be, it's an area I think we have yet to, to discover, you know, that group, how we, how we can help those kids. Um, different ethnicities also affected differently. You know, dr growth trajectories, you know, so uh, quadrupling, just terrifying numbers. You know, so uh, if 6.1% age 19 is, if you've reached that age obese, your odds of becoming a normal weight adult, very low. So you got to catch them early. So even the, you know, 21%, if you're obese at age two, your odds still are against you. But once you get a little bit older, it's more difficult. So age six, you know, I'm not going to read all these slides, but there's something, when you look at these trajectories, before age six is really what matters. Once they get age six, it kind of starts to take off in an irreversible direction. And I think a lot of our treatment and management is trying to do intense treatment 
to kids like when they're adolescents. But somehow, I think you know, this is just what I think, right? Maybe we have no clue. What can we do before they're age six is, is a hypothesis worth, worth testing. You know, so large for gestational age also matters. These kids are already set up. You know, again, age two to six, you know, is rapid weight gain age two to six. You know, we've got to somehow figure that one out. You know, so this one is 80% uh, of kids, you know, severe obesity will become adults with severe obesity. You know, so that's, uh, again, a, a bad omen. We know uh, there's a lot of downstream metabolic, all organ system health, problems from obesity. So medical obesity, you know, is all of these things with, that we've been talking about in the adult population. Yeah, we don't have any, just more stuff. This is that one in a thousand stat there. Um, this was just out last week too. So screening for prediabetes, you know, they just lower that age to 35. Maybe we should be doing it at age six with insulin. Um, the, the scary thing here is just the awareness amongst my colleagues. You know, only 15% of people with prediabetes are even aware they have it. And, and again, we, as we learned yesterday, that's pretty far downstream. You know, so, and how are we doing in our management for diabetes? Only 21% of our diabetes patients are actually meeting these markers of good quality care. You know, so it's rising and our quality of care is not doing well. So maybe we need to get the right people in the room and figure it out. More and more kids, it's just out this week too. Uh, trends this, uh, to, you know, August 24, 31. Type 1 and type 2 are going up in kids. This is 2017, you know, prevalence of obesity, severe obesity in children. We found no evidence of a decline in obesity prevalence at any age, at any age. Despite, this was after Let's Move.gov and RWJF putting about $500 million into these campaigns for obesity. So there's a lot of awareness but when I heard that Michelle Obama's uh, plan was going to be called Let's Move, I, I kind of like had a suspicion that the game was over right then. Because what's that saying is the most important thing? Exercise. And you guys know I like exercise, right? But ounces are lost in the gym, pounds in the kitchen. But um, yeah, the exercise is great. The costs are astronomical, you know, for obesity. Cochrane reviews are pretty bleak, <laughs> you know, so they're, they're the best systematic reviews. It's like a 600-page document, and there's a, they say modest reduction. This is preventing modest reduction in the younger kids, and these are with pretty intensive programs, but most efforts have been null, and once you reach adolescence, it's, it's pretty much null, right? Not, nothing, we have not seen anything work yet. Um, this is treatment for pediatric obesity. So there was some benefit, like Rob Lustig has an intense 30-day inpatient stay. Yeah, so those really intense uh, interventions might help. But once they get older, the evidence is really low that even those interventions are helping. And, and this review kind of left more questions than answers. Pediatricians, this is encouraging. Uh, more pediatricians are having discussions with families on obesity, but what, I'm not sure what they're discussing, but we're having discussions. Parents are actually very unaware that their kid has a problem. So I, th I think that could be an issue too. They come in an eight minute visit, you know, they have an earache or they're well child check. You're supposed to check off 40 thing, 140 things. Oh, well, let's talk about your weight. It's very difficult, you know, how do you bring it up? Obesity treatment programs for kids, the majority drop out. You know, this is hard, right? It's a whole family intervention. So we have to figure out how to make more friendly, you know, more support. Lack of support was one of the main reasons uh, when they asked these families, why did you drop out? You know, they support, like support, right? This is support in here. Okay, so we're going to go get on to maybe some of the causes of pediatric obesity. Is it the junk food, right? So this was the Wall Street Journal. Adolescent girls aren't getting enough important nutrients. You know, it is a junk food epidemic. Over half of what we eat is highly ultra-processed. You know, all carbohydrates aren't bad, right? So, but look back, you know, a couple hundred years ago, these were the carbohydrates. But today, you know, it would be all junk food. And, and I think uh, someone quoted this uh, uh, yesterday. You know, two-thirds of kids now... Uh, two-thirds of the calories kids are eating now come from ultra-processed foods. But there's, a, there's another backstory to that article if you read that article. So two-thirds sounds pretty bad. But that, they included ultra-processed food. But what they didn't include in ultra-processed 
were other junk foods. So foods that were not, were considered okay are grains, flour, pasta, processed grains, white rice, other things with added sugars, peanut butter, canned fruits. So if you actually do the math, it might be 90% junk food. That, yeah, that's terrifying. I mean, there's no way out, right? There's no way out if the kids are eating 90% junk food. Yeah, from the authors, you know, increasing trend in consumption calories, ultra-processed sweet snacks and desserts, strategies to eliminate that stuff. So I think this is about all you need to know. What's real food and what's junk food? You know, a white bagel is junk food. It wouldn't be called an ultra-processed food, but probably to a child's metabolism, it's probably junk food, especially if you put Skippy on it loaded with corn syrup. But that's real food, right? And, you know, and the, ju the junk food companies, you know, are pariahs. Um, you know, this is a, a junk food industry. You know, Michelle talked about the other day about the nutritionists funding from the junk food companies. It's all over the place. You know, it's like over in Asia, food giants are educating our, our trainers. Pretty sad. Um, we know that this uh, Kevin Hall study, you know, he's not the, the most favorite person in, in the room here. But no, he, he does research, and you can just look at what it is. But the people, when they just add libido, it was about 500 calories a day difference, highly processed food versus real food. It was all carbohydrate and fat. Very little protein was overconsumed. So it just shows you people are just ad libidum going for the fat and the carbs. Because the fat, this is the full catastrophe. You know, you have carbohydrate and fat in the same food, right? That's how you, you develop an obese mouse, an obese human human, you know, so that's, that's junk food. <laughs> High energy density. COVID was a disaster, right? This is what they were sending home with school kids, you know, free school lunch. That was it. Look at the cereals. This is what they were getting in these big bags. Yeah, we're giving them the toxin, you know? Yeah, so this, Ted Naiman made this uh, little image here, but yeah, fat and carbs, that's like a packaged muffin, you know, it's vegetable oils, but it's more difficult, right? So the, the red, the dark red, is more expensive. Um, the, the dark blue is, is cheaper. So protein is the most expensive macronutrient. So when we're looking to try to feed people, we have to realize, you know, we're all, we've had a lot of talks about protein is, is wonderful, but it's more expensive. So we've got to figure out how we can get more protein in these kids. Um, I wrote this article at the beginning of the pandemic, you know, is it time to quarantine junk food? And, and, and uh, you know, we've seen kind of what's happened with with COVID, um, uh, Nina Teicholz and I got, got this article published. It took nine months of peer review. Just, I mean, we we're just explaining the scientific rationale of metabolic syndrome, but it wasn't, uh, and it still isn't a, a popular conversation. Um, you know, it should not have taken nine months to get that article published. <laughs> yeah, so maternal junk food diet may affect offspring. This is rats, but <laughs> it might. Again, this is what we don't know. Um, yeah, we, we know Lily Nichols' book is great, so everyone should read Lily, Lily Nichols' book, uh, Real Food for, for Pregnancy. It should be called Real Food for Humans. It's a great book. Um, shows about junk food marketing, right? It's a big deal, right? So it's, we're fighting, like, big corporation and farm subsidies. You know, subsidies are going to junk food. Okay, let's talk a little bit about sugar. So, okay, we talked about junk food, but sugar in kids. So I had a project last year. We went into elementary schools. This is before COVID, and we did all these little focus groups. It was for a grant project. And this was elementary school kids. So 38% of them have three-plus uh, sweet drinks a day. Only 21% um, had none. Three-plus. These are elementary school kids. <laughs> Yeah, they have an innate taste, an innate taste for sweets. These are some articles just about how kids and their brains, they, they have a unique predispensity to really like these foods. You know, they're more attracted to sugar and even these low-calorie sweeteners, you know, these artificial sweeteners like diet soda, you know, so that can really start to affect kids' brain. The amount of sugar consumption is just taken off in a crazy way, 40 times. It was four, uh, four pounds of sugar per year, 1750. It's about 160 pounds now. Uh, per capita of, of sugar consumption, you know, soft drink consumption, you know, again, going up like a skateboard ramp. You know, this is talking about uh, glucose versus fructose, because, you know, you could read Rob's work. There's probably something a little more nefarious about the fructose and what this does to the liver and creating this visceral adipose tissue. So this just shows you the difference between the VAT and the sub-Q with 10 weeks of making a little shift more to the fructose side of the house versus the glucose side of the house. And these are the beverages um, this is uh, Rob's study. With just nine days, you can start to bring down liver fat in children. Just nine days. And this is on a, you know, a eucaloric diet. These kids are eating 
bagels and pizza, just getting rid of the sweet drinks and it's eliminating a lot of the liver fat in these kiddos. You know, so yeah, I mean, I think we've covered that stuff pretty well, you know, in the last couple days. Um, uh, these artificial sweeteners, you know, these, I don't think these are like truly benign or the, the solution for obesity. You know, a decade ago, fewer than 10% of children were, or at the beginning of the millennia, so 20 years ago, fewer than 10% were consuming these artificial sweeteners. Now it's one in four and obesity is going up. This is pretty scary. More than half of toddlers drank juice as their only beverage on any given day. Yeah, how do you win? The AAP actually called it out. You know, we, we used to be taught that, you know, tell kids to start drinking juice at age one. Like from, they're like, okay, oh, maybe that was wrong. <laughs> we made a mistake there. Eat the juice. Don't drink the juice, right? Give them an apple. But this is real, right? So packaged baby and toddler foods, they all have added sugar. You know, they all, all these packaged foods, they have you know, more than 20% of sugar and all these biscuits and these cereal bars for kids, right? It's just, it's everywhere, it's everywhere. Um, it might even, the fructose might even differentiate where cells are, are going, you know? So like w which cells are gonna differentiate into, into fat cells? This is the homeschool environment from the same project we did. So soda, sports drinks, snack chips at home. So the, on this side is the middle school kids and the other side's elementary school kids. But these kids, their home environment is just landmine, landmine, landmine of, of these foods. Sugar sweetened beverages and, and screen time together is the two things that really stand out when they look at surveys on what's really driving it. So those, that's like the d double disaster is, is put the soda in front of the iPad or something, or the juice, right? It's all the same, you know, but we're still like in school menus and I work with our local school with, with their, you know, trying to brainstorm a bit how to work within their DGA menus, but they're required to limit salt, but not sugar in their menus. You know, and this is a lady in Colombia, you know, taking that on, it's, you know, taking on this industry usually does not treat you kindly. You know, what do kids eat in school? Um, there's Al Gore from going way back. Yeah, so this was a, a study like, okay, do we give kids breakfast in the classroom? Um, it had the unintended consequence of increasing obesity. So if we give them the standard school breakfast, yes, it will increase obesity. You know, you can look this up, like look up school lunches through the ages and you see some interesting things. Like what do kids eat? You know, like, I don't know if people in this room are older than I am, but just remember what you brought for lunch, right? Or like if you had a school cafeteria, it's totally different like what people had in the 60s. In the 70s, the fast food industry actually got into schools, right? They started s selling in the school, you know, things uh, we saw the trajectory of obesity, you know, um, here's the school menu from the 70s. And actually, when you read this, it actually looks pretty good. It looks much better than uh, the next slide I'm going to show you. So this is, you can actually pull up, this is a county in West Virginia. So this is what is on the school menu. This was a day from last week. Breakfast has 141 grams of carbs. Lunch has 89 grams of carbs. These are like kids this big. And then they go home again to pizza and Mountain Dew. You know, so that's 230 grams of carbohydrates <laughs> at breakfast and lunch. Disaster. This is from our high school. They unplug it during the day and then they are allowed to plug it back in for after school activities. You know, and it says there, what's it say? Healthy snacks inside. You know, it's, it's terrifying, right? Meatless Mondays, right? We've all kind of seen that, like in the press, the meatless Mondays coming on, all right? So yeah, so they, like they, they looked at this, not, no, no bueno, right? it's not good. Look at all the deficiencies, you know, if you do this, do not, tr you know, impose vegetarianism on your children. And that's not a belief system or, you know, a environmental discussion. You know, this is, we're just talking about health. You know, it may not be, right? It may not be the right decision. You know, these kids are having stunting. So bariatric surgery for kids. I only got a couple slides here, but, you know, this is Rob Sivas's field. But yeah, so here's uh, from the group that does bariatric surgery, should be considered standard of care. I know, we're like, pause on that one, <laughs> you know. I know, you're like, oh. But they're the ones who do the surgery. Yeah, yeah. Okay, does it fix everything? Mental health problems persist. Yeah. Decrease in bone mineral, I mean, not un unintended consequences, right? Anemia. But we saw, like, it can have some weight loss from that. But th these are kids, right? So 
Yeah, we see a lot of uh, post-bariatric surgery patients in our clinic, and it's very rare to see a well one. It's very rare. I mean, there's usually multiple uh, vitamin deficiencies uh, going on. Um, yeah. Obesity is a metabolic disease, even in children. Rob's book's really good. I, I like it. But, you know, I'm not going to go into detail of all these slides, but, yeah, you can just type in insulin resistance in children into your PubMed. There's a ton published here, right? So as they progress from an overweight child to a pre-diabetic and diabetes, their insulin sensitivity starts to deteriorate, you know? So this is actually a really good article. It was just published end of last year in the JACC, and, and, and I, I like sharing articles, like, with colleagues, especially, you know, from other fields that come from their own journals, you know, to make the case that what we do with metabolic health is important, because this is from the cardiology journals. You know, early preventable, early and sustainable preventive care is the model that we need to look at, because this was from the cardiology journal, and it's kind of a busy slide, but there are two drivers here that they talk about in this article, adiposity-based chronic disease and dysglycemia-based chronic disease. And they're identifying that pre-disease state you know, which, which uh, Dr. Pata was talking about yesterday. You know, and this is where we need to stop the train is, is right there because as you progress it over, there's the ad adiposity effects. And this is like right out of Raven from the 1970s. You know, you've got those effects from the hyperinsulinemia. Then you've got the dysregulated glucose causing other problems. But, you know, the insulin resistance is the driver of this. Insulin resistance is the driver because at risk is... And this is that seed versus the soil, right? So there is a genetic component to obesity, which we haven't gotten into today. There's a few uh, very rare, you know, pure genetic variants, but there's the seed and then the soil. So we're talking more about the soil today than, than rare types of, of pediatric obesity. Insulin resistance, uh, you know, Robert Lustig, 2006, talked about, you know, this is a metabolic disease of hyperinsulinemia and how insulin, high insulin state blocks the leptin receptors in the brain, you know, so the body's not seeing the leptin, so it's not getting those satiety signals, but this isn't new to you all. Um, this, I just think that's really important because, again, this is another thing where all these articles are saying the burden in younger and less severe obese cohorts cannot be underestimated when we're looking at cardiovascular risk, because the cardiovascular risk is huge. And these are the early markers out of that, that article there, which, which had a ton of data, but a lot of labs. But you see that high glucose really didn't come in, and high A1C, but high insulin and high triglyceride. Vitamin D is kind of curious. That's children, you know, so maybe we should be testing vitamin D, but we don't know if intervening with giving them vitamin D. But it's just telling you the, you know, the canary in the coal mine might be the insulin, because if we wait, these kids, you know, becoming obese have normal glucose. They're just storing it away just fine. And as this is kind of going from young age, three to five, the darker, to the uh, teens in the white, but you see that high insulin state, everything's kind of moving toward high insulin, high triglycerides. They still, look at the glucose, it's still pretty, pretty normal range. You know, so we're looking at the wrong thing if we're just looking at the glucose and we're trying to identify, you know, kids early. Um, yeah, greater risk of death, cardiovascular events, you know, as kids, this is following them into adulthood. Yeah, prevention, ultimate goal. This is another AHA article, so right out of their own. It's a very bleak article because this was their scientific article on severe obesity in children. Basically, nothing is working, you know, so we must prevent it. But again, like, we have to take this and make the rubber hit the road. You know, lab markers, you know, we got the lab guru, uh, good Dave Feldman back there, but there's, yeah, so they're looking at glyc A, LPIR in children, and not surprisingly, these markers, this is glyc A, I don't know much about glyc A, but as you go from a high BMI and poor uh, cardiovascular fitness, these markers are up across the board in sixth grade and eighth grade girls. So you just see these trends, like these are markers of this insulin resistant state. This is the LPIR score, you know, so as you go from high, you know, low to high BMI, low fitness category, you see the LPIR score kind of trending in that wrong direction. It's not an expensive test, about $99 through LabCorp, LPIR. You know, NMR testing, so yeah, it could be another way of just, I, you know, getting awareness out there. But I, I don't think we need all, all this stuff. I mean, I think you know the child coming in the room who's got a belly, you know, and you get a history, 
you just have to try to help that parent understand that, okay, we have a problem. You know, we don't need to have a lot of fancy labs. You know, and I, I think we see this too, and this, it's travels like these, maybe we are, kids are just little adults metabolically because there's the discordance between the LDLP and the LDLC. That means as they become more obese, there's a higher number of the particle number as with that total LEL being the same, you know, you have a discordance. The particle number is higher, you know, smaller LDLs within the same ultimate level of LDL. Mental health and binge eating, you know, Dr. Palmer will address this more. But, you know, so this is insulin, uh, uh, longitudinal trends in insulin, resist, uh, insulin levels in children with psychosis and depression. And Chris wrote a really good blog on this. But yeah, this stuff travels together. You know, I don't know if it's the insulin level causing or that's a marker that the kids who are obese, are, but I think there's something metabolic happening also in, in the brain. And it, you know, I'm not the one to speak to that you know, with any expertise. Um, food addiction, you know, glycemic load. So kids are binging off of these foods, these highly processed foods. It's, it's about, you know, one of the, the trials here, it's 100% of the foods kids will binge off of are these highly processed foods. Um, maybe low carbohydrate, this is adults here, but maybe low carbohydrate diets for kids who have binge eating can be a, an option, you know, should be an option out there. You know, if we can fix those, that signaling to the brain, you know, 100% of binge eating was ultra processed food. They're not, they're not binging off of canned tuna. All right. Yeah, so intensive therapy. So you can treat binge eating, but this is, you know, intensive therapy, 89%. You know, so Joan's program sounds wonderful. I'm looking forward to downloading some of those videos and sharing them because most of us don't have access for our patients to get one year of intensive therapy. It's hard to get, it's in, in my institution, if I refer to mental health, it's a year wait. One year. That's a problem. So you got to, oh, I'm depressed, right? You can see uh, a provider in a year. Oh, that makes me feel good. <laughs> You're even more depressed. Okay, got a few more minutes here because I do want to hit just a few more things. Effective weight loss meds for kids. Is there any? <laughs> There's one med approved for children. What is it? Orlistat. I know that's scary. Leaky, oily stool. <laughs> Here's Junior, have the Orlistat with your junk food. I mean, that's approved for kids, right? It doesn't really have any systemic, so I think, yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, this article about the pharmacotherapy. Yeah, I mean, there's a need. I mean, I would hope that maybe we can develop something in the pharmacology world that might help this, but I don't know what that will be, and I don't want it to be expensive. What about the milk, right? So even the sci scientific literature says, what about milk? Whole milk or skim milk? Less obesity. Whole milk, less obesity. Yeah, it's across the board. There's multiple studies. Yeah, so here's, but in school they give them flavored milk because skim milk tastes like chalk. I actually asked this question and we parked out and as part of this project we did with the schools, parked out in the cafeteria and we did the milk count. 90% of the kids grabbed chocolate or, or strawberry. 10% grabbed 1% or skim, and they probably ended up in the trash. <laughs> but I'd ask the kids, why do you like the chocolate milk? Oh, it's delicious. What about the skim milk? And you see the kids give you this look, because it does, it tastes horrible. So the chocolate milk's delicious. <laughs> so that's, why they, that's why they have it, yeah. So this is all over the literature, you know, just look it up. But, and our, you know, we're, we're feeding our kids the stuff that's making them fat. Okay, the role of exercise. So you saw that video there. We host races which raise money for our nonprofit which builds trails at schools. So we build these little fitness trails and these are kids in one of our fitness trails. So it's great, these kids are out there running. Um, yeah, and there is some effect on exercise and obesity but it has more to do with uh, like the insulin sensitivity um, is, is what I've gathered from the literature but it's not really a, a weight loss type of tool, but it, you know, exercise is wonderful. We need kids to exercise because the combination of low cardiovascular fitness and obesity is a bad omen you know, for pretty much everything. So we want our kids to get out and move. We want it to be fun. Um, this talks about insulin resistance in kids. 
But what was important about this study, which I liked, it had 94% retention. Now, if we make exercise a regimen, this is like military PT. You know, I spent 29 years in the service and not many people liked going to PT. You know, other than, you know, the real down rangers, they loved it, right? Because they were just the combat controller types and the PJs. But enjoyment, enjoyment, I think was really important. 94% retention is pretty good for exercise program. You know, and I like this book uh, down here on the Bob Bigelow, Just Let the Kids Play and Spark John Rady. So we have this culture now of like tearing kids at like age six into single sport, travel, elite soccer teams and stuff. And the rest of the kids are kind of left behind. And, uh, you know, tra uh, tearing kids into single sport early on makes them really like hate sport later on. So, so we want kids to just be out there. Play is the process. Fitness is the product. Uh, finish with low-carb diets for kids. What do we know about this? Um, so most of what we lo know about low-carb diets is, is uh, you know, the pediatric epilepsy world. You know, uh, Eric Kosoff's work is, is awesome. So yeah, and these kids are not obese. So these are some things, you know, so yeah, when you read these uh, large articles kind of digging into everything about, you know, ketogenic diets for kids, you know, there might be some uh, height uh, discordance with normal kids. Lipid values often nor, all, you know, normalize, so you're going to get this little bit of turbulence as they start this diet. Some GI stuff, the same thing you'd expect from someone starting a low-carb diet you know, that can be worked through. Renal calculi, so here's a, a citrate supplement. Um, my good friend, Dr. James Bales in Huntington, West Virginia, is probably the lead here, and he and I are starting a trial on low-carb diets for children this fall. We got doing the IRB right now. He wrote this book in 2006 after being exposed to Atkins <laughs> from a resident, you know, when, when he was, you know, lost weight and he started reading about it. And he realized that none of his patients, he's a pediatric endocrinologist, he realized none of his patients were getting better. And then he kind of turned everything on his head. It's a great book, 2006. He published an article in 2003 on low carbohydrate diet. So he was like way ahead of his time. And he's, he's working in the, what once was the most obese city in the US, Huntington, West Virginia. You know, so yeah, five kilogram loss. This, is a, this was a like 12 week study. And then he's got, this was a three month study here in kids, you know, and they lost about nine kilogram in that period of time. And so our study's gonna go out 12 months because people, oh, people can't sustain that. But I, I think they can. You know, I think they can, and, and Dr. Bales is awesome. But these are really good reads. Read his, his work. Um, this is a study, 12 weeks. This is Karen Zinn from New Zealand. You know, t two kilograms, um, needed full family support. This is hard, because kids, you know, don't have control over their, their food environment. Um, Nancy Krebs article here. So when compared to low fat, the low carb diet worked in children. You know, so yes, the, the you know, proof of principle is there, right? It's a metabolic disease, it's keeping them on it. On it. So this is, uh, you know, our protocol for the IRB. So the kids are gonna, and, and Rob Cyrus says this is, a, it was good to hear him just talking offline. This is what he's doing, less than 30 grams of carbs a day. You know, it, just with a list, right? It's hard for them to count it precisely, but that's the goal is to get them less than 30 grams. Do not be hungry, right? We don't want them hungry. You know, not, no limits on the protein of healthy fats. We want them to eat to satiety. No sugar drinks, absolutely. Not even milk. Try to get rid of the snacking. You know, and if they, we have snacks that if they are gonna snack, and be cheese or a pepperoni stick. Get them out exercising. And the key thing is, you know, the, the family's gotta embrace it. Like if the family isn't doing the diet, maybe they wouldn't be quite as strict, but the, the family, you know, little Johnny can't be having you know, his salmon, and then the rest of them have Domino's pizza. So, but we'll see how it goes. That's why we do experiments. Hope for the future. You know, this is David Lud Ludwig. It's hard to envision an environment more uh, effective than ours, creating obesity. You know, we'll just kind of end here. Community-driven. So this is the ABCD Institute. So this is the, let me go back one, because this is asset-based community de development. So the solutions are going to become local. You know, they're going to have to be local solutions because top-down is, isn't happening, right? Did the dietary guidelines change? No. Is it going to change dramatically in the next five years? No. So it's got to be community-level stuff. So look at your own community. 
what can you do? It's the only way change has ever happened is small community-based change. You know, that shouldn't be a new concept. A couple things we're doing here, we're about year six, and we have a double SNAP program at our farmer markets. We actually got some USDA funding, so they did, USDA did something good there. <laughs> they helped us seed this, and we keep raising money, so we're year six now. And uh, more people are SNAP eligible now, so you can go to your farmer market, and uh, your 10 bucks becomes 20 bucks. So that's, that's a pretty good deal, but most uh, families on SNAP don't go to the farmer markets. But it helps your local farmers, and they meet the farmers. It's a little seed. We've got a pretty robust farm to school initiative in our county. Um, I really like it. These are really innovative. The extensions are working with them, farm to school, planting gardens. Kids learn where their food comes from. It's pretty cool. Um, Joel Salatin there in the red shirt. Um, we have a lot of local farmers. It's really difficult for local farmers to get their their foods to market, right? There's all these barriers, and he's been a pretty disruptive and angry voice there. This was from a conference a couple weeks ago. Um, just wonderful watching him, and he's a very funny, animated guy, but he tells it like it is, Polyface Farm in Virginia, but very difficult to, to get local farmers to be able to sell their stuff with all the USDA regulation. Minimally disruptive medicine, whatever we do for families can't be complex. It has to fit into their life. In medicine, what often happens is we intensify the therapy. We intensify the therapy. Now, if you're a busy family, got three jobs, you know, you got kids, you know, trying to make ends meet and we try to make things more intense, how's that going to work? doesn't work in the real world, but that's kind of like our medical model. So we have to kind of do the opposite. It's called minimally disruptive medicine. Whatever treatment we give has to fit into, you know, the context of their life. A couple of fun books. Uh, this is Tim Noakes, Superfood for Children. Case for Keto has a chapter on, on this. And I think David Ludwig, Ludwig probably has the most experience with pediatric obesity, and this is kind of his take. You know, a third of people, they're not ready for this. A third make minimum some change, but they struggle their whole lives. They haven't fully embraced it. And a third actually fully embrace it, and their lives change. It's pretty good, a third, right? When the null is zero. So we, let's work for those th that third, and even that middle third, right? The ones who are kind of on the fence, they do, it, do pretty good, and then they fall off. But that's a struggle, so we should just shoot for that have to eliminate the toxins, right? We do that for kids, right? They have to wear car seats and, you know, you don't let them drink polluted water, breathe polluted air, but yet we weigh them in school and at the same time feed them the foods that make them obese. I think that's child abuse. <laughs> I really do. Yeah, and I said that in a, in a meeting. It's, yeah. Our role as a group, you know, maybe we're like mountaineering guides, you know, we're trying to ensure safety, evaluate the terrain, guide by example, but what we want is to make people self-sufficient. That's really the holy grail, right? Then they're, they're, you know, that last stage that Joan said, you know, they're fully fulfilled. All right, that's it. I know I went a little long there, but that was, uh, pediatric obesity is a lot to cover <laughs> in uh, 45 minutes. Um, this would be my dream, right? Wow, we used to let kids have sugar, right? We used to have cigarettes in hospitals. Holy shit, right? <laughs> Wasn't that long ago. All right, that is it. Thank you. Yeah. And you just That's my book. I wrote, I did write a book, which has a whole chapter on kids. Uh, I work in family practice, and I do order metabolic markers on kids more for the parents than, yeah. you know, for the kids. But my question to you is, do you think that the insulin level should be a different target for kids because they're growing instead of five, maybe a little higher, or do we know anything about that? Yeah, um, I, it's pro I mean, I don't know. Yeah, so certainly if you see a kid who's up at that, you know, 20, 30 range, you know, I think it, you look at it in context, and maybe you would follow it, mm -hmm. you know, over some time with a dietary change. But I don't know, does anyone, if there's someone in the room that knows more about using insulin levels in children, please uh, chime in. But I don't think the value or the range is, is different. You know, that less than five is probably, you know, five range, what we're shooting for. 
Mark, thank you. That was inspiring and depressing at the same time. <laughs> I want to ask um, why I showed the video. Maybe we should watch the video again. Yeah, that was terrific. <laughs> For the video at the end, not the beginning. Yeah. So, so I'm a health coach and a mother of three daughters um, who, are, who are growing up now. But um, I want to ask you about sort of the culture of acceptance of obesity that we're living in. Um, I remember when my kids were in middle school, you know, they were these throw out the scale campaigns. And, um, and so, you know, and I get it because of like, you don't mm -hmm. want the fat kids to get bullied and you want it, acceptance. But I feel like, you know, when you see mannequins in Target that are supersized mm -hmm. now, it's, you know, I don't know, it, it, school psychologists obviously do a lot in this area. What is your experience with all of that or your um, advice now as a health coach you know, when the taboo, like, oh, you don't want to mention it. Um, what do you think about yeah. that? Well, I like that one JACC article because they actually had a comment on that. So it's adiposity-based chronic disease versus calling it obesity. So, so you know, if, if it was, you know, your daughter and her name was Jill, you know, I'd say, you know, I'm seeing that Jill may have some risk for adiposity-based chronic disease. You know, would, would you like to talk about that? You know, so, so deal with it in that model versus, I mean, maybe, but I think, yeah, we, we have to not shame, we have to, you know, embrace this just like you would any other, you know, medical issue. You know, I see, um, you know, we know for sure, you know, in these children that if they have visceral obesity, it's going to affect their health later on. Let's, do you want to talk about that today? And then our solutions need to be things that, you know, the kids enjoy. Like, you know, engage them, you know, and I'll get texts back from moms, you know, how's it going? And they're like, they, they like being, they, they're making their own omelets and, you know, you want it to be joyful. Like you have to work with that child, you know, and the foods that they like, right? We're not restricting things, you know, you have to, you get to have this. But yeah, keep it really positive. Right. Right? Not punitive, obviously. Yes, right? of course. Yeah, yeah you got to yeah. keep, I mean, if, if we make it punitive, and I think it's probably just experience and like each encounter is going to be different, you know, kind of the Brian Lenska's approach, right? Like each family's kind of their own N of one, you know, what are the landmines for this family? You know, this family's genetics are just disaster, right? So that you can't control. But, you know, start with, you know, I, I like the program Jamie Bales does, right? You know, you got to look, you can't kind of half do this, right? Because if you're like, well, let's eat this way at home, but then feed them the school lunch, it's, you know, it's like I think Eric said this before, driving on the right-hand side of the road or the left-hand side of the road. You know, you can't really drive in the middle when you're talking about metabolic syndrome and reversing it, right? So if you're in the middle, it's just not going to work. So we need to be honest with the families too. Because if we say, well, the moderation's fine, you know, they're kids, we're kind of kidding ourselves, right? Because it's nice, friendly advice. The parent might like that advice, but it's not going to work. So I think, yeah, I mean, it's that intellectual humility and honesty. Say, like, honestly, if, if we're going to address this, we should be on the right-hand side of the road, but maybe, like, start here. Let's work on these things. I don't know. It's going to each... But, yeah, we have to be honest with them, and these kids are, you know, up at that 140th percentile. <laughs> you know, we know they're little diabetics. Yeah, absolutely. Thank ready you. To hap ready to, you know, their glucose is fine, but... The insulin up, same thing. Thank you. Eric Westman, Durham, North Carolina. Um, thank you, Mark, and thank you for the talk, and thank you for your leadership through the years in this area. It was complicated, and I really don't know anyone else who's put together education and thinking through integrating working and, um, with walking and running and, and food, and so thank you. Um, for that, um, uh, I hope you'll be able to continue with the education as you've done so well in the past. Um, I'm wondering if the SMHP could do a pediatric obesity statement. And maybe this be on the docket as a project. A statement? Uh, yeah. uh, like uh, a, I'm sorry, a, a position statement on pediatric okay. obesity. That would be. Because there's good. so many factors. I mean, I've watched my endowed. Uh, program at Duke, which means they don't need to make money. There's an endowment that supports the pediatric obesity program, so they, their program doesn't have to work. 
I learned from the Obesity Medicine Association, doctors were there, you know, doing fee-for-service. Their program has to work or they don't have a job. Yeah, a lot of pediatric programs, they don't have to work, right? They, yeah, like they, they don't charge have to work. and they don't have to work. And but I want to also suggest that you don't want to wait for doctors for this. You don't mm -hmm. want to wait for the clinical treatment of people uh, really at any stage. You want to prevent this. And so this means uh, a pilot project among schools, among a PTA uh, program where uh, don't wait for the doctor. That we're still hung up in the fat is bad mentality, that paradigm, and and um, so I, my pediatric program at Duke has just one you know, well-intentioned people, but the, you know, well, doc, you know, Eric, we can't feed people fat, and, and we'll send them for weight loss surgery, and but we can't feed them fat. And, and I just want to share an anecdote from, I met uh, uh, Picard Morceau who created the first bariatric surgery. And it, it's, it's like you said, Mark, I mean, they're taking out a normal organ. So I thought, I have this, I have this uh, chance to tell uh, the doctor who created bariatric surgery. You know, we think what you do is really kind of silly, or, or not silly, it was more, it's harsh. You're taking out a normal organ a normal organ so that someone, you know, doesn't eat, you know, right? So if we're doing that in children, that means the environment is the problem. And yes. because <laughs> what what Bikar, do it 40 years ago. What the doctor said is I take out the organ to save the organism. So a surgeon, a doctor, a professional will always have a rationale for what they do. But it, the, so I'm just saying now, what you're going to see from the OMA, I'm past president of the Obesity Medicine Association, we're going to see drugs. We're going to see Saxenda, the shots now being For studied kids. in mm -hmm. children. And you know, while that's all well and good, we, that's not the only thing. So most doctors at the Obesity Medicine Association use pills and shots and drugs. Not, we're not the surgeons, we're the medical doctors, although we've taught keto and low carb there. Um, so I'm just assuming that family medicine is even, you know, beyond or behind in that regard. Yeah, we're not and, talking about this stuff at all. Yeah, yeah. yeah so Still I would encourage. About, I mean, our own journals, right? Energy restriction. You know, not even mentioning carbohydrates. There, there are journals. It's, are there it's any a, other directions we should be? No, looking? I think I like that idea. Just having a scientific position statement. You know, that people can go to and read it and just as a scientific opinion, you know, every, you know, the, the bariatric surgery wrote that position statement, standard of care, right? right. So that's their position statement. Obviously, we're going to have our own biases. We think this works, right? They think what they're doing. I mean, it's fine, right? Like, I'm sure people want to help people, but they're going to be, I think, yeah, I mean, we could probably, I have a folder of 50 articles preparing this, <laughs> you know, make a bank of these articles, let people read them. And then well, the unknowns. And that's just people could where fund, help fund research, like Dave, right? So maybe people would want to help fund, you know, who are passionate, help fund more projects, you know, like Dr. Bales or, you know, Bob Sivas. You know, he said he had a hard time getting uh, his database published. You know, he has like a thousand patients that he's got. He's got it all written up, and he, he can't get it published. So, so this is so also a plug for becoming a member of the Society of Metabolic Health Practitioners. Thank you. No, thank you, Eric. Learned a ton from you. Actually, if I can capitalize on the point you just made, uh, and to Eric, I have to tell you, the hardest thing for me to do was to go up on the stage and ask. That was the hardest thing. Collecting the donations wasn't nearly as hard as it was for me to just ask. I would, I would say it doesn't have to just be a Citizen Science Foundation. Start one. So anybody start one and start to ask the community, this is one of the most amazing communities that I've seen to make this kind of thing happen. And if we have to do it outside the box, let's do it outside the box. It's just got to happen. So I, I definitely encourage you, Eric, and anybody else to say, look, try to find new solutions because actually this ties into the question that Mark knows I'm going to ask, which is, unfortunately, I know within the system there is pushback. There is a problem because it's not just as simple. A lot of people outside don't realize this. We'll constantly go to doctors like yourselves and just be saying, hey, why don't you just make this happen more? Why don't you just, you know, bring this to your colleagues more often? But 
unfortunately, I know a little bit, I hope you'll share, that it's not that simple. Sometimes there's, sometimes there's people that are less um, interested in hearing about it and may make decisions that can affect your career, right? Yeah, yeah, it's, this is risky business. You know, when you talk about this at academic institutions, <laughs> yeah, and, and you have to make sure you've done your homework before you would suggest this approach to a child, right? Because even amongst our own, you know, faculty and people treating kids, you know, what, what I do is, is not the standard of care. You know, so I, I have to, and you know, as a, a family doc, you actually have to do your homework a bit more because, you know, if I'm not a pediatrician, right? So, so people just by their training, you know, o OMA or something, they, their credential might, you know, I'm a family doc, right? Where the experts disagree, the ignorant are free to choose, right? So that's one of the beauty of being a family doc, right? Every, everyone has their own opinions, but yeah, so you've really got to be, you know, politically, you know, respectful and when you're calling things out for safety, you know, if things are said to kids, you know, and I, I've spoken out and it's never gone well. <laughs> so, um, you know, respectfully. So again, it's the task conflict, not the, you know, so when we have conflict, we want it to be a task conflict. You know, there's a patient safety issue. You know, let's look at these different approaches. It's, it's never, you know, I, I think this person's a bad person or I don't, but, but you see that kind of come back at you where if you call out a task conflict, it becomes you know, you're put yourself up for ad hominem attack, you know, t to you and, and your character and intent. And that's, let's, let's, let's not behave that way when we have conflict. Let's stick to the data, stick to the science, listen, be respectful, and, and hope that people treat you the same. And if, and if they don't, don't let it bother you. I, I've come to that conclusion. Thanks again for all you do, Mark. Thank you. No, no, thank you. I kind of want to follow up with what Dr. Westman said uh, with the SMHP. So I did look for a new doctor last year for us and for my son, and um, he's 10. We went to a pediatrician who's certified in nutrition, and she said, here's the paper with the MyPlate recommendations, and he said, oh, you're wrong. You shouldn't have low fat, and you shouldn't have that many grains, and, uh, and she said, well, yes, you should. You really need to have low fat. And my husband and I were there and we said, well, look at my child. He's been low carb for four years and he's hitting every marker. And she said, well, I guess just keep doing what you're doing, but this is the recommendation. <laughs> yes, yeah, so well, you saw it, the AAP recommendation, yeah, the CDC true. recommendation, National Heart and Lung Blood Institute, like every, the AAFP, every, and, but there's no science behind it, right? So they, just like the 270 page 5210 report on how to implement this in your school, you saw the scientific paragraph which said emerging science may suggest, and you're like, holy cow, like the train has left the station. So, so we, we, we make opinions. Well, they, that they hand out the MyPlate at school. It's in the front cover of their, their book. And my son in his classroom told his friends, well, just scratch this out and scratch this out and scratch this out. And this is, I fixed it for you. Yeah. But we, we need, like, yeah, maybe. Yeah, I, I have a plate, too. I go around. It's the plate, and I have a red X red, red that's through X that whole thing, whole right? Slide. The insulin, and it's two plates, right? Yeah. If you're insulin sensitive, right, let the kids have all that. So it's, I think we just need to differentiate. It would be nice to have a, a chart, child. maybe from the SMHP, saying this is a recommended different plate. For an insulin-resistant child. Yes. Yeah, if the kids are fine and well and on the, you know, football team they, and they're doing fine, like, not everyone needs to, and that's what I think people don't understand. I think everyone like the, needs to have whole foods. I think it's that, yeah. that push away from processed would be a good yeah, nudge. Get rid of the junk food is across the board, right, for all kids. Like, we're feeding kids junk food if we knew in what, school. If we knew what junk food was. And yeah, I don't we don't. It's don't like, know. yeah, it's all, you know, organic <laughs> Rice Krispies or something. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and the, and the, you know, we, we know it, like the AHA gives General Mills, you know, all this money to put heart healthy on Fruit Loops. I mean, they, they're not making that up, right? So it says heart healthy because it's got juice in it or something in Fruit Loops. It's the other way. General what is it? Yes, yes, correct that. Yeah. Yeah, the AHA makes the, the money. So thank you. This has been a soapbox of mine personally for a long time. As a mom, I have two of my own, two of my stepkids. So kids are coming and going in my house at all times. And of course, getting two sets of households or three sets of households on the same page is 
is uh, different, um, which is probably 50% of America Kool-Aid, now, right? right? That's the Kool-Aid mom. <laughs> the, yeah, the and job. my kids know. They hate me. They get annoyed, whatever. And they're young and healthy and fit and thin, and I have a stepson that's not. So luckily, we can see his issue, right? But the other issue are the issues we can't see. So luckily, you can see fat, which is cool. But we can't see the ADHD and all of those mm-hmm. things. And I, I just... I mean, I don't know how we're supposed to get through to people without scaring them that they're going to have COVID or whatever it is that for them to see, they can't see, they can say, oh yeah, I have ADHD or I have anxiety and anxiety is cool now, apparently on Snapchat, like it's cool to have depression and anxiety with these young kids. So I just, I don't know. I want to hear from you. How, not just talking to the parents, but I guess more of a bigger, how, how, do you, how do you suppose we explain that to people better where they're, they have to be scared, I guess. I don't know. I don't know what the, what the, how to do that. I mean, the, I mean the fact when they come in and they have medical obesity, how would we? If they don't even have that and they're like, well, I look good. Yeah. I mean, I think people, there's some, it's the third, third, third. Some folks probably aren't ready for that conversation yet, right? If it's, they're struggling with Zoom school and like families going through a lot of trauma. Sometimes that conversation, it's just probably not the right time. And then maybe that one you wanna to try to get in the middle of the road, right? Just get rid of soda or something, but they're probably not gonna be a candidate for the 30 gram carb clinical trial, you know, at, at that stage. But you've yeah, seen not- it improve mental health and, and all of that, right? Oh yeah, I mean, when kids become I mean, we, we know exercise, that's why Spark is a powerful book. John Rady, I think he's retired from Harvard now, but yeah, we know brain-derived neurotrophic factor. Every behavior in child Im- improves. Exercise is for the brain. I mean, that's why I got up and ran this morning. It's for my brain, it's not to burn calories. You know, it's the best, uh, you know, endorphins, endocannabinoids, right? That's endogenously produced pot, <laughs> right? So, so it's safer than, you know, or going to Oregon where, uh, where Peter is, where they've got the good stuff. But no, I mean, that's what, I mean, we see it. There's a program that started in the UK called the Daily Mile. And they're looking at mental health and kids. All they do is open the door and let the kids 15 minutes. They don't have to put on gym clothes. They just go, that's why we're building these trails, right? Just open the door and let the kids run. <laughs> um, yeah, but the sugar, you know, is is also a mess, right? We, we know that, like the yeah. kids. Yeah, it's, it's hard, because again, like as Ludwig's article said, you can't, you can't imagine a worse environment for children. I mean, and COVID just added to that. I mean, it was bad enough, and then you add COVID into it, and it's, I, I, yeah, it's, I don't have, I think, one family at a time, which start with your own family, model it, Right? That's all we can do for kids, I think, too. This is probably a point worth making. You know, what can we do for our own kids? You know, have a safe food, and I tell families this. You've got to have a safe food environment at home. Right? You can't have chips in the, in the cabinet. Safe food environment. And you want to model for them. Right? So I'm not sitting around watching television and eating Fritos at night. Right? You model for them, and you, you know, in, involve them to have a healthy relationship with food. If kids don't have a healthy relationship with food, then then that's a problem, but that's kind of the crux of it right there, safe food environment at home. The good Brian. Oh, he's like nervous. Yeah. Doug's like, oh no, it's Brian. But I just want to let everyone know this guy is a giant, right? I mean, he stood up to, I know we're not supposed to make a statement, but I'll ask you a question. How the heck do you do it, man? Because what you did in the hospital getting sewed out, when you see the craziness, like Eli Giroux and I were talking, they're putting people on sugar water overnight, and they say, why? Well, they're NPO for tomorrow. They're diabetic, and they're sugar. There's everyone else eating while they're sleeping, right? Like yeah. the craziness of what we do with the sliding <laughs> scale and all that stuff. Yeah. But for you, you're working de-prescribing medication, CGMs, all that stuff that we can get up and talk about that you've paved the way. What Dr. Finney's doing with Verda, showing benefits, survival benefits, you know, decreased um, ICU stays, intubation with people with COVID. How do you do it when you're the only guy who sees it your way and you're sitting there with academia looking at you like you're nuts? I don't know. <laughs> I go run every day. <laughs> and I do burpees. <laughs> so for, for bad. But on one uh, side you have pharma, the other side you have yeah, big food, uh, and none of those guys like you. And you're I not think, getting you know, a sponsorship. You know, 
I, I, I go to work every day. I mean, like, and I've told you know, my colleague Chrissy, you know, I, I go to work for my patients. You know, that's who I work. I, you know, I work for my patients every day. You know, and I, if I do, do that every day, then who's throwing daggers at you from the left or the right? It really doesn't matter. And if one day they throw you off the bus, so be it. But you show up every day and you work for your patients because that brings us joy, right? When you see these people coming off of their insulin and you know, I've got like 30 of them on my phone with monitors and you see these flat lines and you're like, and then you text them and you say, good job yesterday. And you, I mean, cause yeah, that, it's, that makes you want to come back to work. Because you're changing lives, you know, one at a time. It's, well, thanks for all you're you do. doing too, you know, with your practice, shot, but, you and But you paved the way for the rest of us, so we, mm -hmm. we appreciate that. So thank you. So I'm an adult psychiatrist with no children, so I know nothing about kids. <laughs> <laughs> um, help me understand the study design, your study, um, but also when we're looking at pediatric obesity, it does not seem like weight loss should be our goal necessarily. And the reason I say that is as an adult or somebody who only treats adults, mm -hmm. like we, we aren't growing anymore. Yeah. And so weight loss is a good measure. But I was thinking that in children, a better measure yeah. would be so BMI. The, the results of the trial are going to be ZBMI, but also LPIR, LabCorp. You know, um, Jim Otvos uh, com is complimentary doing the LPI LPIR NMR on the kids at zero, six, and 12 months. So that's really, I think, going to be the big marker. So, but, you know, the BMI per age, you know, because there's going to be a year in there. So it's, it's B the BMI right. per age. We're going to do waist circumference, but that's hard to, t a lot of people don't measure that right. Um, but you, you know, you, you can, I mean, B BMI is, these kids, uh, is one marker, but if you can combine that with, so this healthy weight loss, I think most would agree, if your BMI goes down in every metabolic marker that is attributable to cardiovascular risk is also going down. Right. You know, if we had impedance type of scales and we could measure fat accurately, but that's, again, it's a pilot, right? It's, they say it's a pilot and um, you get funding to do something, wow, we should add, uh, you know, DEXA, you know, something like that. But that takes like real money. I mean, we had to seed grant to get $50,000 for this to pay for the RD, who's going to be taking a lot of time to, you know, almost like a Verta type model, having a dashboard and trying to help these mm -hmm. families, calling them once a week, you know, how's it going, what recipes you need, <laughs> you know, and the RD is, is, is key. She's uh, someone who's, who's really embraced this lifestyle herself, you know, kind of like Michelle turned everything, you know, she learned in RD school <laughs> on its head. So I think she's going to be a good fit. I know we have like four minutes before Chris. That was the second part of my question was, are you just giving them information? You're not giving them food. Oh, yeah, yeah, they're going to have to, and there's a nice little list of foods with carb count so they can you know, kind of roughly add to 30. I have a question. Are you aware of any um, literature on epigenetics playing a role in this? Because it seems like things are accelerating. Yeah, I mean, we know that certain ethnicities more predispose. So, you know, again, it's like, you know, genes load the gun lifestyle fires the trigger. Um, so, but I didn't really dig much into the true epigenetic signaling. But uh, yeah, I mean, uh, all, I mean, when you see something go up like this in four decades, it's epigenetics, right? That, that's not a genetic right. thing. You know, there's something in the environment that's triggering that gene. And what is it, right? That's the question. We don't, what is it? Is it the sugar? Is it the junk food? Is it something else? I don't know. We don't know. That's what we have to figure out. We can make a hypothesis. I think it's the sugar, <laughs> you know, that's my hypothesis. Get rid of the sugar. Okay, we've got a couple of minutes left, so let's try and get through these next two questions before the end of it. Hi, thanks for your presentation. Um, my name's Angie and I'm a physician in central Minnesota and I do mostly general internal medicine and weight loss medicine, but I'm MedPeds trained and I right. did pediatrics till three years ago. And I have worked with some kids, and I just want to share something. We certainly do prescribe metformin in yes, kids, metformin no matter what age. Mm -hmm. And I want to just share a little tiny short story. I'll keep it short. A uh, little Cambodian boy I worked with, and I saw him when he was about 10 and a half. 
and he had a fasting insulin level of 35. He had triglycerides of about 350, HDL 25, normal LDL, fatty liver. His neck size was 18 and he snored. I knew he had sleep apnea. Mm -hmm. Borderline hypertension and waist circumference was 40, something like that. 10 years old. 10 years old and Mm -hmm. of course he was above the 99th percentile on the chart. And I worked with him for like two years, seeing him monthly, and we sent him to physical therapy to increase his physical activity. And we just weren't getting anywhere. You know, his, his family, his parents were both thin, his brother was stick thin, it was just God. him. And, and the mom worked from home and was not watching them and stuff. And so finally, after two years, I thought, okay, I, I, pre- I do prescribe medications, and I've used fentramine in a lot of adults, so we use ADHD meds like water in kids, and fentramine is a distant cousin, so I put him on fentramine. He lost eight pounds the first month, and his, which is safe, they can lose two pounds a week mm-hmm. when they're you know, high risk, and you've tried other interventions. And then the second month, he lost another five pounds, but I got a call from the physical therapist. He's not hungry, he's not eating. And uh, I said, yeah, but he can live off his body fat for a long time. <laughs> and uh, the, the end of the story is, is uh, he got very frustrated because he got mixed messages and he just stopped coming. And it was unfortunate. The behavioral therapist didn't help either. She's like, you can't be doing this. That's all. Just wanted to share yeah, yeah, that. No, I think metformin, there's not any real data on it for obesity, but we're using it in PCOS and, you know, probably under the guidance of, you know, good physician, short-term fentramine, if you can help them make some. We, I use it for adults, you know, while we're trying to help them, you know, make better choices, but, you know, it's not a long-term med, I don't think, for either children or, or adults. When I look back, the Surgeon General report on tobacco was very influential. 1964, many people quit smoking. My parents did. Not until (laughs) some years later. Why not a Surgeon General report on sugar? Um, Is there going to be a, you know, Surgeon General or, wait, can you be in the public health service? Because I'm not military. You could be Surgeon I could General. Be. Yeah, I don't want to be Surgeon General. <laughs> <laughs> no, but yeah, it's, I, I think you can make uh, these, that's, you know, Nina and we really fought hard for the dietary guidelines. You know, we had petitions going around with Low Carb Action Network, but there has, yeah, next strategy, yeah, we should chat, there has to be like a, a next strategy for this awareness of sugar, a surgeon, I mean, chili, right? So one of the slides I didn't really talk about much was chili. Uh, the country, Chile, is putting warnings on, like, junk food. So we, you know, that would be wonderful if we could do that here. But you, you have know, to be in, in the public health service to be Surgeon General, right? Probably, yeah. I'm retired. <laughs> uh, <laughs> my, my service years ended three well, years ago. <laughs> or we could target someone else who... Yes, who find would... some, some with more energy than I do, some young... <laughs> I, I know a few very motivated young Air Force officers.